unlike most people, I find it very hard to watch movies passively. So because of this, I don't really watch that many movies because of the fear that my mind will somehow self-destruct eventually. Nonetheless, a few times I do sit down to watch a film. I really sit down to watch a film. <laughs> For those who really watch the area or at least are curious to know what I mean when I say I watch the hell out of movies, this one is for you. So in this memesy African homage to classic Zimbabwean filmmaking, let me take you back to the good old days in a time graced by young Olvam to this flamboyant dance moves like these. <laughs> A time in 1993 as we take a deeper look at C.T. Nangarem Gaz classic film Nyeria. In this special edition that explores Nyeria's three greatest forms of adversity in the film. So the story follows the newly widowed middle-aged woman Nyeria, played by Jesesi Mungoshi, who has recently lost her husband and must battle his remaining relatives to rightfully inherit his and her own property in a really patriarchal Zimbabwean Shona society. Nyeria, like most, if not all, of the female lady characters in Tsitsidangarevga's work, in general faces a lot of issues and discrimination from the people that surround her just because she is a woman. I mean characters like Tambu, Nyasha, Mashingai, my guru from Nervous Conditions, and Martha from She No Longer Weeps all have depressing sexist experiences they could drink some bitter tea over and Nerea in fact could be the secretary general of that club. Again as a lot of her work, the movie strongly and consistently attacks this patriarchal system from start to finish. The oppressive sexism Nerea faces comes at her from all angles but in this film this misogyny mainly comes in three forms. These are the character Phineas traditional values and the society in general itself. These three things all contribute and are related as they work hand in hand to make it really hard out there for an Afro sister. Number 1. Phineas The first and arguably the most notable is the scene-stealing obnoxious character Phineas, excellently played by legendary actor Dominic Cavaninti. Caravanti, is that right? I don't know. Caravanti. <laughs> Phineas is the dominant antagonist who drives the story forward as he is the focal obstacle that stands in Nerea's way of conserving her property, mourning her recently departed husband in peace and the well being of her entire life, really. His character being an effective source of comic relief in an otherwise really depressing movie, it can be hard to see through just how despicable his actions really are. He is the breathing personification of this misogyny itself. As the audience, you may fail to notice that TT uses Phineas as a device to expose, critique, and attack the bigger picture of the deeply rooted chain of patriarchy in Shona society and everything wrong with it. Now Phineas is a real angry penis chauvinistic Look at it this way, if Phineas ever lost his wife for whatever reason, for some reason, his reaction would probably be something like this. And I paid good money for this nigga. Courthouse got papers to prove it. And we got papers yeah, proving he's you. free. I own you. You belong to me. You hear me? Oh, I'm and I'm and torn. Yep. He's really that bad. Phineas sees women as little more than property. I mean, some of the things Phineas says are hilarious, but if you think about them with a deeper, more feminist mind, yeah, you realize this guy is a real piece of work. Look, man, she's your wife, our wife. Yes. This paddock here helped pay for her. Since when do you ask your wife permission for anything? <laughs> I'm beginning to get worried about you. you. You put too much faith in these women. No, man. How can everything go to Mavis? Huh? She will take everything into her husband's house when she gets married. It seems like anything that comes out of his mouth is an outpour of misogyny and bluntless sexism. His actions show compliment his words too. He cheats on his wife, then goes on to hit on his brother's grieving wife around the time of his funeral. 
tries to steal her entire property and even sells some of it and blows this money on pointless things. Since you steal my money, my furniture, now my children, you, you. don't touch me. And if it wasn't for Neria, this irresponsible behavior would have very well killed Neria's daughter, Mavis, when he ignored her ailing health that would have led to her death. A few more hours, she might have not lived. It's a severe attack of appendicitis. The crazy thing is for most of the film, all of these terrible destructive things he does are just bluntly ignored by the other relatives for most, if not the whole of the film in its entirety. You would wonder what gives him so much power and immunity. Well, it's easy. He's a man. He's a man. <laughs> At least that's what tradition says. And Phineas happens to be very aware of this discourse. Which leads us to our second point. Number two, traditional values. In the beginning of the film, it is clear Neria is a great mother. She is kind, hardworking, down to earth, and who, like her husband, also provides for the extended family. Phineas, on the other hand, is a lazy, immature bar ranger who may have never worked a single day in his life. Seriously, this guy never does any work in the whole film. Well, what do you want? Nothing, I just came to see you, that's all. Yet, when his brother dies, he still feels obligated to move to the city and quote, Of course, Shingi. I'm prepared to take the responsibility of looking after you all. Huh? But it's clear between Nyeria and him who should be the caretaker of the other. But unfortunately, traditional norms do not support something like that. To tradition, women should always be submissive, passive, and dependent on the man. In Shona tradition and most other cultures really, a man is always the head of the family. He is the pillar of the family, he does the heavy duties, he provides, he protects, he even builds the house where they are supposed to live. A man has all authority to take care of a family such that women are not expected to assume the duties even if the man lives or dies. This philosophy is so deeply rooted particularly in Shona culture that even if the husband dies, his younger brother can take the overseeing duties of his remaining wife and family in a norm called Musara Pavana. Or in other cases, he can just inherit this entire family in also a norm called Kugaranaka. Oliver Mtukuzi, since he sang about pretty much everything, also has a song about this. You guessed it right. <laughs> Anyway, unlike Tuku implies in the song, Neria wants to tend on her own two feet. She doesn't want to be taken care of, let alone by someone like Phineas. This raises an important argument directed towards culture. What if the remaining wife, especially in this modern age, who is as independent as Neria, doesn't need a pillar? And even worse, this remaining brother-in-law is a real piece of <laughs> who can only drag her down. Well, the problem comes when Shona tradition just responds. Well, at the end of the day, you still wear a dress, hey? So, you know, just get with the program. <laughs> This is where the major issue arises. In plenty of her works, Sisidanga Rebuai has strong female characters who happen to be intelligent, talented, ambitious, but have faced a lot of painful challenges of holding their true potential back just to live in harmony with these traditional norms. Tradition that says as Nigerian author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie eloquently puts it, we teach girls to shrink themselves, to make themselves smaller. We say to girls, you can have ambition, but not too much. You should aim to be successful, but not too successful. Otherwise, you will threaten the man. If you are the breadwinner in your relationship with a man, you have to pretend that you're not, especially in public. Otherwise, you will emasculate him. This is probably one of, if not the biggest gripe City has with tradition, that it cripples or at least tries to tie down the real potential of ambitious women everywhere. Have you noticed how Neria only wears black traditional dresses after her husband's passing? Or oh, this is by coincidence. 
as the voice of T.T. Dungaram was speaking. A voice that can be also heard in the other text in the other work. In the other work, T.T. has addressed this unfair dichotomy numerous times. As I said earlier, she no longer weeps and nervous conditions. Her female characters are marginalized from opportunity because of tradition. For example, in She No Longer Weeps, mother's achievements in the law faculty are ignored just because she did not follow the traditional channels of marriage. While in nervous conditions, it is obvious that Tambu is more intelligent than her brother Namo. But just because tradition says she's a girl who should be more concerned with washing dinner plates than reading and writing, she can only watch from the terraces as her Dhamma brother goes to school. So this is the breakdown to what Titi truly wants to say with the black dress. Of course Neria wears the dress because she is mourning her departed husband, but considering the themes in her other two classic works, I seriously doubt this is the only thing she is mourning. Neria wears the black dress to reflect that bleak sexist society she or Titi are born into as well as their deep resentment towards it. But um this idea of men sympathizing with each other is also difficult. You find it in lots of areas, for example, in rape cases, uh, a policeman or in, in cases of domestic violence. A policeman would not be as hard on a male offender as maybe he ought to be. The black dress symbolizes that dark cruelty towards women especially if they are alone and without a male figure in their lives. If you think I'm bluffing of how women are seen as nothingness just because they're not married, you should listen to what most preachers perceive to be a woman's ultimate crowning achievement. <laughs> This attire represents the cultural bondage women are in. Hence, when she first breaks down at her husband's funeral, as she is coincidentally given the traditional headway, Nera is not only weeping for her husband, but all African women in general who have been in bondage because of this attire. Number 3. The Society Despite the destructive things Phineas does, not for a single moment does he reflect on his behavior because the people who surround him never condemn or force him to check his behavior. It's almost like it's acceptable. When Phineas is being a d they always they always sort of laugh it off or just plain ignore it. However, when it comes to Neria in many instances, especially with their mother-in-law, they actually go out of their way to demonize her. Her mother-in-law is always complaining how lazy she is. She's just not doing her duty. She's not doing her work. But she is the one who wakes up deep in the night into Neria's sleeping hours to sweep her yard. And not because she is acting out of kindness, but just because she needs that far-fetched evidence that her lazy and unruly daughter-in-law forces her to do duties that are supposed to be hers. And when her husband dies, instead of maybe consoling your young grieving daughter-in-law who has been left alone to care for two children, this is what she says. I told you I didn't want to come here. My sister, where's the love? Phineas, who represents many chauvinistic men in Zimbabwean society, growing up as a boy to a man, he obviously has realized it somewhere along his life that he can get his way with no consequences simply because he is just that a man. <laughs> he has discovered that he can exploit this manhood, which he, of course, purposely does to extreme levels. He has realized long time ago that tradition always favors the men because each time Phineas wants to do something that conveniently benefits him at Nera's expense, he usually attempts to use the channels of traditional norms to do so. I want my children! How can you behave like this at your husband's home? You have no respect for our ancestors. Hey, house! What are you talking about? 
I paid the bride price for that woman. They insist that it must wait. Why are you in such a hurry? Don't you understand, woman? It is the duty of the elder brother to look after the family of the young brother. Joel's never here, so I must do it. That is why Phineas is such an important character to the film. He clearly lays out all of this opportunistic and just an emotionally abusive behavior that society is so used to sweeping under the rug. In this role form, the satire he exhibits shows the kind of damage that can be dealt to society as a whole if cultures and people are not checked or questioned from time to time. Cause the only checking Phineas knows is the checking he does for his younger brother's inheritance once he is dead. With this dichotomy, it now becomes clear that Phineas is not the only enemy, but also the society that surrounds him, that pampers and tolerates and even teaches this behavior. Cause it's not like they don't know it, right? Unfortunately today, there are greedy people who just twist our tradition to suit themselves. This brilliant portrayal of the characters and the plot forces the viewers, men or women that watch this film to deeply reflect their own involvement towards the oppression of women, of whether they are really doing enough to protect the girl child, even if they are not directly involved in the oppressing itself. Some of the men here might be thinking, okay, all of this is interesting, but I don't think like that. And that is part of the problem that many men do not actively think about gender or notice gender is part of the problem of gender. That many men say, like my friend Louis, that everything is fine now. And that many men do nothing to change it. If you are a man and you walk into a restaurant with a woman and the waiter greets only you, does it occur to you to ask the waiter, why haven't you greeted her? As you know, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Of course Nera didn't bow down to this patriarchy system because it's a movie so it's destined to end on a good note, right? <laughs> so watch out for our joint part 2 and the continuation of this analysis next year when we delve into how CC's Neria battles and eventually wins the battle against Phineas and the gang which saw her gain her property and independence back. So see you then. And as always, thanks for watching BC Africa. Till next time. Thanks again for watching the video. Super grateful, guys. BMC Africa is a new pan African media brand dedicated to enlightening y'all on that rich African literature, historical, artistic, cultural heritage in our awesome, modern, relevant social media kind of way. We're always in the process of creating fresh, new, quirky, Afrocentric videos like these. So if you want to keep updated on our latest content, don't hesitate to follow our online pages on these major social media platforms, which you can learn quite a lot from too. And of course, if you like what you saw and want to see more, please, for the love of the motherland, don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you next time. Peace.